that 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 10, the picture there, it's not fantastic, but I, I looked at tabernacle. So those of you who are students of the word online and here, well, no, the tabernacle was a temporary place where God dwelt before his temple was built. Yeah, so that's the background to our, our slides this morning. Um, so let's read. It's always good to read the word of God, as Phil said earlier. So we, I'll put it on the slides this time. There we go. Look at that. And I'll read from my iPad. This is from the New International Version, 2 Corinthians 5, and we're reading from verses 1 to 10. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we grow, longing to be clothed instead, instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each of us may receive what is due for us, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Amen. So you'll notice, because of my lack of technical expertise, from time to time, excuse me on camera, you'll see there's a line. That's not because I've made a mistake, and I'm crossing Christ out in this case, it's because I didn't know how to remove it. <laughs> okay, you know, sometimes you're doing something, preparing something, and the little technical things take ages. And I thought, no, I spent enough time trying to get rid of this. I failed. I'm not, I don't give up easily, but I did. So here we go. Amen. Right. Introduction. So this passage actually seems inappropriate, and uh, uh, Brian is with us today will know in the sense in the sense in which it starts a new chapter because much of it relates to or the, certainly the first part of it relates to what was spoken previously about the body and we, I spoke about that last week so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do the same I'll just copy my notes from last week and put them onto this now so I have them. so it carries on so a lot of the commentators would say this isn't really an appropriate place for a break and uh, I tend to agree with them because they know far more than I do. Um, and Paul is speaking to the church. He's speaking to the church. And, and as he does speak to this Corinthian church that is full of beans, you know, lots is going on there. A lot of stuff is going on. And, and he's trying to shape some of their church conduct as well as teach some of the key themes, spiritual themes, and address practical things around life. Isn't that what we should be doing every day anyway in our, in our church lives? That's what church life is, you know, is about. But he continues to address this theme of a temporary residence, even though previous week wasn't called that, something else, which I can't remember because that was the previous week. Um, but it's still a, that, the theme that was following on from chapter 4. And then a little bit on the end, little bit on the end, it's not really a little bit on the end, it's a massive bit on the end that I'll deal with in a little while. Is the, the last couple of verses talk about appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah, you sort of solemn nodding, that is scary stuff, isn't it? Probably. Who knows? I'm certainly not sure. I'll tell you what I think later. So here we go. So that's where we are. We've set the scene. Let's move on. So I've picked out 
as we look at today's uh, passage, a few, just a few points, which Phil will be glad about, and Adam will be even glad about. Just a few points to highlight as, as Paul goes into this um, dialogue with the church. And you can't not highlight this little bit about in this tabernacle. And where it says in the, well, let's read, well, while we're in this tent, it says tent actually, doesn't it? Go back. I might not stop here. Bear with me a second. I'm just playing with the presentation because that shouldn't look like that. Okay. So you're going to have to imagine. You're going to have to imagine. I'm going to do this. And you imagine that what I'm going to say there appears here. <laughs> okay. So. For, for tent, read tabernacle. And tabernacle was exactly what I mentioned earlier. It was that temporary place. It was that temporary place of God's presence. And you know, um, people speak of, of God's presence. And it, in those days, it was in the Holy of Holies. And I believe, and I've mentioned this before, that only certain people could go in there. The Levites were the chosen people to do, have that spiritual service before God. And there were times of year that they could go in. And not only that, I believe I'm right in saying uh, they used to tie a rope. Is that right, Brian? Yeah. A ro yeah, tie a rope. Yeah, if I look at Brian, I'm out and right. He says no. Then, All right, speak to Brian afterwards and you'll correct me. Um, uh, they used to tie a rope with the priest who went in, in, in case anything happened to him, because nobody else would go in there, because they feared what would happen to them. So if he sort of fainted or collapsed, They'd have to drag him out via the rope. Scare, scare or died. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Uh, scary stuff. Scary stuff. So, but it was temporary because they were moving from place to place. And, and that's how the disciples, Paul here, speaks of the body. It's a temporary place. It's temporary. So don't worry about it. It's temporary. It's okay. I mean, it's, it's not okay when you're living in it sometimes, is it? Because it's uncomfortable temporary. Sometimes in your youth, like the people, the young people that bounce around where I work, I think they're like invulnerable. They're like superheroes. Oh, let's not go into the detail of what they do, but there you go. But I'm not quite of that ilk. My bones creak. I, was, I went away on, on the mum, I went to wife and had a fantastic time. That's another testimony, but there you go. Um, and on the, when I got back, I said to Jan, I wonder whether I should take painkillers because then I could sit on it for longer without being in pain <laughs> with my left leg in particular. <laughs> but there you go. That's this body that we're in, we're stuck in. And but the tabernacle would be constructed and deconstructed, a bit like us, isn't it? We're constructed and deconstructed. You can have new knees. Anybody had a new knee? Anybody, anybody online had a new knee? New hips, anybody? I tell you what, we are healthy people in here, aren't we? Or we're walking around like we're waiting for a hip or knee operation. Because the queue's about five years. I speak to Phil about that because he's just a local counselor. <laughs> okay. But this is where God is. But we're just as the tabernacle was the place. God chose to dwell. So now, by his spirit, as it says there, by his spirit, it will say later on, he, cho he chooses to dwell in us. We are that temple. We are that temple. You, know, so you can have fantastic buildings, but they're devoid of any character, of any sense of God's presence. You know, that shouldn't be the case for us. Because we're the temple of God, we shouldn't be characterless, we shouldn't be empty, we shouldn't be devoid of God's presence. It should be overflowing in us. Should, amen, thank you. Feel free, I fill in the gaps when I'm still thinking. <laughs> but it should be overflowing from us. You know, so that overflowing presence of God that fills and overflows in our lives, I, I pray for that. 
you know, when I came up here, and then Phil's chatting, doing his thing, she does, being a West Point fan, and uh, you feel, I feel anyway, inadequate. But that, in, that, in a sense, that's good. Because then, for me, I don't rely on my adequacy, my skills, but hopefully somewhere in what I say, God's grace and God's spirit will minister to all of our hearts in some way. So we need to be full of God's character because it's there, it's in us. And it talks about the fruits of his spirit, that character growing in us, that develop over time. Jan, Jan reminded me, as we were having our barbecue yesterday, Jan reminded me of something I'd said a long time ago, which was not good. And it worked seriously, it wasn't good. And uh, I felt bad, rightly so. And I thought to myself, I am not that person now. I'm not that person now. Good job. <laughs> God continues to work on us and shape us in the who that we are by his Holy Spirit because he dwells in us because we're his temple. And that's massive. That's so important. I'm, re I'm reminded him. Well, no, I'm not reminded because I'll do that later. So he says, Paul here talks about a sense of purpose, a heart. When he talks about this book, but while we're in this tent, temporary, we groan and are hard, burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed. And he talks about being clothed. And then he says, so that what is more may be swallowed up by life. Eternal life. Swallowed up by eternal life. The future that's to come. You see, he had such a grasp on what life was about. I, I mentioned the other day, uh, last Sunday, about, you know, our, our life on this earth is not even a drop in the ocean. But it's so hard to get your, around, uh, get your head around it, isn't it? But he got it. They absolutely get that. They're swallowed up by life. This, this short existence, this breath that we have, is going to be swallowed up by eternity. Of not, you know, that is going to be awesome, whatever that is. But he kept a hold on it. He kept a hold on eternity. You know, sometimes the challenge for us as Christians is can we keep a hold on eternity while we're living in the temporary, while we're living on earth, while we're living in our lovely houses, some lovely houses, some are cleaner than others, <laughs> uh, have our lovely cars and motorbikes and work and food <coughs> and all the rest of things, and I sit in the garden, one o'clock the other night, it was one o'clock, my daughter had an argument, she was out. One o'clock, and I was looking at the stars because it's cooler outside than inside. I cannot, that heat is ridiculous, isn't it? It's great, but it's ridiculous. And at one o'clock, I was right outside on the sun there. There was no sun, obviously. In the, this is in the morning. And I saw a shooting star. I'm sure it was, I thought, am I losing it? Or was it a shooting star? So I had to Google it. Are there shooting stars in Cabot? I guess there are, because of the, the, the thing. So, whoa, great, I saw that. And at least comes and said, yeah, you did it. I went quarter past one then. And we had a conversation. So, it's temporary. But it should shape, because it's temporary, it should shape how we look at things. How we live life. As you can see there, or not, Mark 8, 6, 36 says this. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? See, if you don't know the Lord this morning, then the world is all you have. And life, when it ends, ends. But if you know the Lord this morning, this life is a precursor. It's the warm-up. It's the aperitif to what is to come. The main course 
is waiting for us. And hopefully the pudding as well, because I do like pudding. You know, it's still there. It's, it's, it's yet to come. But trying to get, get hold of that so we can lose sight of that. Because, because the world we're in wraps us up so intensely in everything that's going on. Not that we, well, we've got to exist in it. We've got to live in it, haven't we? We can't, we can't just ignore the world and say, oh, I'm just going to live on this other planet thinking about the future. You know, you know there's sometimes to talk about, um, what's it, Christians being so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. That's of no use whatsoever. So, how does that shape how we look at life? How does the fact that we're, this is temporary shape how we look at life? Let me post some things here. I'll have to read my small bit, which I can. The mortal man, the man that does not know God, the mortal man, the things of life there have an earthly value that is huge, that is, that is their own value, the only value. Their plans, the mortal, plans of a mortal man are for this earth and for this life. Work, promotion, retirement, a lovely home, beautiful garden, family. Those are the plans of mortal man. But for the believer, not that we, doesn't, we don't want all of those things, absolutely, those are good things. Those are absolutely good things to have. But the value of eternal things have to be held in mind. Have to be held in mind. I'm reminded. It changes how you live your life and the things that you do. Bear with me, I'm, I'm, things moving around. <coughs> because of the priorities and the way that God looks at and we look at what we do. In Matthew 10, 42, it says this, Jesus speaking, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. A cup of water. That person will certainly not lose their reward. Holding on to eternal things. Having attitudes. Changes your attitude to how you live. That it's not self-oriented, but it's God-oriented. It's wanting to have the character of God. The mortal man is looking for self to promote self and see what can I, how can I live life to the fullest, to the max, right now. And, and so much of what our commercial world does promotes that. And Luke, Jesus in Luke challenges us with this. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them, without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. Won't be from them. It'll be eternal reward. It's an eternal perspective. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. 
So it changes the way we behave. It changes our behaviours and how we are. Because of, because of eternal perspective and not just a temporary one. Because of a God perspective and not because of a, just a Nigel one. We live differently. We behave towards others differently. We react differently. Our expectations of ourselves should be different. Now this might work. Look at that. And then he goes on to say, for we live by faith, not by sight. What a massive statement. And I, can, I cannot do that justice in this short time. I could take longer, what did he have? No, okay. <laughs> I can't do this justice in this short time. We walk by faith. You know, some people say, I've heard it said in the past, you know, uh, missionaries have gone out there to uh, Africa, wherever, they're walking by faith. Absolutely they are, but let me tell you, we're walking by faith every day. We're walking by faith every day. You in your normal working life, if you know the Lord and you're with him and he is with you, you're walking by faith. And it says, not by sight. Well, sometimes we need a bit more than what we see before us. That's a huge challenge, isn't it? That is a, such a small phrase, but what a massive statement. What a huge challenge that is, to walk by faith and not by sight. And I'm sure, you know, we look back on times in our lives when we've only seen what we can see. <laughs> And the faith to see beyond it has not been there. And yet, and yet, God has done something amazing. God has stepped in. God has transformed situations. Hasn't he done this? And he steps in and does things that are incredible. And he does the little things. That are amazing as well. So here's my very quick testimony about how God cares for us in our daily life. So I had my little trip away, it was my birthday treat on my motorbike to a lovely venue in Wales. So I set my sat nav because I'm going through my geography, my classes. Sat nav <laughs> initially it took me down some roads and I'm thinking these are not <coughs> roads. This is not a road, this is not a road, a comfortable one on my motorbike. Anyway, and then, having got past Ludlow, and it took me into Wales, and the roads were amazing, better than I am. And the breeze through the dented jacket, fantastic. I am living the life, apart from my left knee, after that couple of hours. Fantastic. So I'll have my day there, and then the next day I'm going to come all the way back to pick up Jan, because I think. Dan needs to be here. Uh, how good is that? That's my little bit of there. <laughs> so I put my uh, sat that back on and go all the way back, and it's fantastic all over again. Except there's no venting coming through. I'm thinking it must be warm. I can't feel any air. Uh, and it was hot, but I haven't got a temperature gauge and all that posh stuff. But I knew it was hot. And again, it took me around with the tracks. Oh, ridiculous, but great. So then I pick up Jan. And I said to John, I, went, I had to go to Wolverhampton to pick up the car, to change the car over. And uh, I said to John, wait till you see these roads I've been on, John. So off we go. Totally different. Totally different. We were talking motorways. We were talking motorways. Oh, my God. I said, this is the way I came, John. It must be because we came from Wolverhampton. So anyway, we did the night there. Oh, wait, I put the sack down in. Bang on again. We got, I said, Jan, wait till you see these roads, the sheep on the side that I have to slow down for, and all of it is going to be fantastic. No, it was the motorways again. <laughs> you know, and I think to myself afterwards, God, that was great. Because I had a fantastic time on my motorbike, and I had a very practical time in the car. But Jan didn't see anything that I saw. Sometimes it's great to share your experiences. Unfortunately, I didn't get to do that. 
but I'm sure Jan will appreciate it. not going down like this all the way. So that was an aside. There you go. God cares for us. So we walk by faith. So what does that mean? So that means not that, oh, this is annoying. It must be when I said it. Here we go. You're going to have to imagine. Hope your imagination's good. In the present. We walk by faith in the present. It's not like just for the future. It's for here and now. You see, God cares for us, doesn't he? He cares about us. That's what that little story is. I think, I absolutely believe God gave me that lovely journey on my bike. And then gave us a practical journey in the car. Nobody's going to convince me otherwise, apart from my son. But God cares for us in our everyday lives. He <clears throat> just sometimes huge things and sometimes small things that say, hey, there's your blessing. Lord. Or I've straightened that path. As I've said before, when I was working with the local authority, uh, I had a really good, a good friend, Ben, who uh, it was a time to be, get alongside this guy who was around. And um, so many times God would bail me out because I've forgotten this or there was a meeting and it's cancelled. Fantastic. And I remember coming back once and uh, he said, Nigel, what about me? I said, it's cancelled. And I had this phrase. And I said, you know what that is better, don't you? He said, yes. And I'll have to delete. He said, it's that big grace of God again, isn't it? And it was. So many times I think, grace of God, the grace steps into our lives, and I sometimes think we need to look out for it a bit more, because we miss it. I think God's grace has touched our lives and blessed us in a moment, and we haven't spotted it. We just got off, gone on with it as if it never happened. But actually, God just brought a bit of order where I've got my disorder. His grace. So we live in the present, and God knows we've got to live in the present. And you know what? He cares about our present. <laughs> Even though we're in this mortal body, he didn't just say, oh, okay, might have said to Adam, you're out, get on with it. You're going to have to work hard now. Absolutely. But he cares about us. Matthew 6, 28. This is a lovely passage, Matthew 6, 28. It says, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Perspective of a father that knows our earthly needs. You know, in, as I was reading and preparing. I read one commentator, and I've got some of his quote, because I thought it was good. It said, by faith, in the belief of those things which we do not see, we believe in the existence of objects which are invisible, and we are influenced by them. To walk by faith is to live in the confident expectation of things that are to come. In the belief of the existence of unseen realities and allowing them to influence us as if they were seen. The people of this world are influenced by the things that are seen. They live for the things that are seen. For the objects which the world can furnish as if there were nothing left 
unseen or to come. The Christian, on the contrary, has a firm conviction of the reality of the glories of heaven, of the fact that the Redeemer is there, of the fact that there's a crown of glory and that he lives and acts in that reality. And as if we could see it all, the simple account of faith and living by faith is that we live and act as if these things were true and could be seen. So walking by faith, you see, recognising that God the Creator has an innate priority for our lives, an innate priority for our well-being. His instructions are full of, you know, when you read the Word of God, it's full of how to release yourself from stress, how to know life. What does it say elsewhere? I have honey. Somewhere it says, eat honey, my son. It's good news. I'm sure that's in the, the Old Testament. Talk, talking about eating honey. It's good stuff. Depends on the quality of the honey you don't But anyway, so there's loads, there's loads of health, well-being, and all of that, you know, all this wellness stuff. God was that bad. Why did all anybody thought of it? Because the Bible is full of not only our spiritual wellness for our an eternity, but our, our wellness in this life. He wants us to be well in this life. He wants, what's he say? He said, I've come to give them life and life more abundantly. And that translation in John 10 10 is super abundantly. Super abundant life. Not mediocrity, super abundant. That's what I want. Hallelujah. Adam said to me, because the kingdom kids with me, he said, Brennity is your friend. I love that man. Here we go. Right. Let me move on. So this is the scary bit. Let me change hands because my hand's going up. <laughs> that was, I've been here a long time, so that. Right, this is the scary bit. Now, I haven't gone into this in any depth because I'm a shallow person. Not all the time, but some. The judgment wall. When I read this, this was scary. This is a massive topic. In fact, I don't know why I advocated this because oh, this passage is full of massive topics. That's probably why I gave it. <laughs> For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Whoa! That sounds scary to me. So that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. That, that could be really scary. But for so many superficial like me, it's not so bad. So this is how I looked at it. This may or may not come up on your screen. See ya. No, it's not going to come up. <laughs> okay. Right, here we go. Here we go. So, in John 1, it talks about people becoming Christians and choosing to become a child of God. A child of God. Children born not of natural descent or human decision, but chosen to become his child. Now, me, I didn't have a dad. Well, I did, obviously. <laughs> but he, he was gone by the time I was two, so I never knew the dad. Now, don't feel sorry for me, that's fine. So I didn't have anybody who was a father figure. And then later on, when my mum got married, which was great for her, they weren't dads. Okay? But that's how it is, that's fine. So I haven't got, some people do have hang ups about God because maybe they've had a bad experience with a father. And that, I'm sure, is far more difficult than my experience. But I think, as a child of God, He loves me. So this place, it's not a scary place. It's not a scary place. It's going to be overwhelming. An overwhelming place to be in the presence of God. In Romans 8.15, it 
It says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. So I'm going to meet this Father God. You're going to meet this Father God. And I'm sure there'll be stuff that we've got wrong. But I'm reminded of the prodigal. How much did he get wrong? Yeah? And look at the response of the Father to him. What a fantastic uh, example that was. Look at... Who's that, who's that guy in the Old Testament who was, uh, had the heart? David. Yeah, David. David, man after my own heart, God says. And look at the stuff he does. Hey. I'm, I'm nothing compared to some of these guys. But you see, this is, this is a God that loves us, that cares for us, that wants the best for us. Then I'm sure he'll say, Nigel, no, you've got this wrong. I'll say, well, I don't, know. I don't know whether I'll be able to speak. And hopefully he'll say, you got this right. You took hold of this. You didn't take hold of that. And it'll be like that. But it won't be a place of disappointment and tears of sorrow and hurt. It'll be a place of reconciliation. A place of redemption, a place of joy, a place of immense fulfillment beyond my wildest dreams. You know, when Jesus was on the cross and the, the guy next to him sort of came to faith, as it were, Jesus didn't say, Today you will be with me for judgment and I'm going to sort you out. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. And of course there will be a judgment, but it was paradise. It's relative. And for those who know Christ, I believe that judgment should hold no fears. It's a place of meeting our maker. And maybe there will be disappointments, but I think my overwhelming feeling is it will be a place of immense tears of joy. Broken hearted happiness. I was telling Jan about happiness. Totally irrelevant, but it's just in my head, so I'll share it. I remember going out with Mike and Charlotte, husband, before he died, and we were on the bikes. And it might have been that we uh, hadn't been out for a while. And uh, as we turned onto this main road, it, and it was, the road was clear, he was like this, on his bike. And when we stopped like this, I said, what, 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 what's that about, mate? He said, it was bike praise. I was just rejoicing in God. <laughs> what was that about? But well, I just think it'll be such a great place when we meet with the Father. There'll be so many great I just, it's beyond my wildest dreams and my broadest imagination. And he says, that's the place where Christians, this is why all through this passage in Corinthians, this theme is, I want to be here, but I want to be there. I want to be here, but I want to be there. I'm struggling in this body, but I've got something to do. I've got things to do. I've got God to serve. I've got to live this out. But I want to be with him because he's got such a deep grasp of what it was that he had been called to do and empowered to do by God. And that's the same for us. Where you are is where God has called you. Whether you're in an office, a school, whether you're a counsellor or, or wherever you may be. Whether you're retired, whether you're helping people fix things, whatever it may be you're doing. That's where God has called you. That's where your ministry is. That's your calling. He will empower you for it. He will enable you in it. He will minister through you in those circumstances. And yet, what is to come is incomparable. 
horrible. But if you're outside of Christ, then that is not the case. Because it's challenging. And people don't like to hear sometimes that side of things. But in Matthew 25, and I'll read this while put on I'll stop soon. Okay, I'll stop this soon. He talks about the sheep and goats. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. That's our judgment seat for those who are Christians. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave something, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. <coughs> then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, we, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then, he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat, and it goes on. There's a separation for those who know Christ and those who don't. So there's a challenge. The same challenge I faced many years ago. And the challenge is, if that is the truth, then that is too important to ignore. If you do not know Christ, if you're online, you don't know Christ, that is too important to ignore. You have to make a decision about that. If I think that is rubbish, then I can just dismiss it and I'll leave with the consequences. But if that happens to be true, then look at the consequences, not only for the future, but for the very present. And therein lies the challenge. And there's an opportunity to turn to Christ, to know him as Savior. And what have you to lose? What is there to lose? You know, sometimes when we're out, we're on the street, and you're trying to offer something to someone, and you reject it, and that's fine. But they don't, sometimes you don't even get a chance to explain what the offer was. And it's saddening, really. Let's just... Father, thank you so much for your word. And thank you so much for your promises. Thank you that while we're in these earthly vessels, we know they're temporary. But we pray, Lord, I pray for everybody here. Bless these vessels, Lord. Bless our bodies, enable us, strengthen us, our minds give us clarity of thought and understanding and help us, Lord, to live the lives that you called us to live. As your word says, only let us live up to that which we have already received. And I pray for those online. Let me just pray our prayer of salvation. Should anyone not know the Lord and you want to know him and you want to just see it's test and see that the Lord is good. Let me just pray. Father, forgive me for the things that I have done. For the, forgive me for my ignorance and not looking to you, for going my own way, for the mistakes I've made in life, the sins I've committed, willful and unknown. And I pray come into my life and transform me, renew me, restore me. Let me be a child of God, to know a present and a future 
with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If I'm live any chance you pray that prayer, please indicate that. Because that will really help us to follow that up. And if there's anyone in the room, please come speak.